this is the meeting of the Northampton Historical Commission. This is Monday, February 9th. And um, it is Monday, Monday, the 23rd. That's correct. It's going to be supposed to be the 9th. And you're going to be the 23rd. And I'm Martha Lyon. I'm filling in for David Drake, who's not here tonight. And I just wanted to begin the meeting by letting everybody know that the meeting is being videotaped. So that's the camera. And it's on you. <laughs> Um, and so before we start the meeting, we would uh, open this up for any general public comment. Uh, would you please raise and stand and give your name and address? Janet Gross, 38 Round Hill Road. And I would like to cordially invite members of the commission, members of the general public, to take a detour some evening or early morning and drive to the top of Round Hill Road to view the lights, the multiple lights that blaze with unrelenting ferocity from dusk to dawn, Sunday through Sunday. Thank you. Uh, and just a question, could you please um, provide the location of these lights for those of us who do Oh, I don't think you'll miss them right at the top of Round Hill Road on the west. On the campus? Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hi, City Councilor Mary Ann LaBarge from Ward 6, and it's an honor to be here. I did not know about this meeting, and many of my residents in Ward 6, and also the abutters of the dam that you're going to be talking about tonight, I have great concerns about transparency and communication with my residents who have been involved with the process of this dam right from the beginning, right to the end. So I just wanted to let you know that there are concerns, and that's why I'm here this evening, because of no communication going on, of them not being notified of any type of movement, nothing with the Board of Public Works working with them, who they worked with them right from the beginning. So thank you for having this. Thank you for coming here. Yes. Hi, my name is Barbara Pellis here, and um, I'm from West Hampton. I have some handouts. I have enough for some of your colleagues that aren't here yet tonight. We're not commissioned. We're not commissioned. You're not commissioned. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. We just ate that here. Great. This is just one more for you too, Sarah. Um, I love history, and I know that the majority of you do too. Uh, that's why you're on this commission. Um, in fact, this commission is responsible for the preservation, promotion, and development of the historic assets of the city. And there's no doubt that the Upper Roberts Meadow Dam is that historic asset. Convinced of its significance, the Friends sought out and were approved uh, for CPA funds, only to have Mayor Higgins disallow the award, saying that she doubted seriously uh, that the dam was of historic significance. So the Friends, <clears throat> completed a Mass Historic Commission structural um, inventory form, and sure enough, the Mass Historic Commission did say that the dam is eligible for listing on the National <coughs> Registry of Historic Places. Um, throughout the whole process, uh, the forum, everything else, um, a lot of things were said. To persuade the residents of Leeds that the dam was dangerous, the um, Board of Public Works introduced the scenario of the 1874 earthen dam failure in Williamsburg in 1874 a couple of times, really muddying the waters. Different dam, earthen dam, different river. Um, Elizabeth Sharp, the authority on the Williamsburg dam collapse, wrote to the city council members at that time to refute any basis for comparison between the two dams. Uh, so simply put, the historic significance of the dam can no longer be questioned. Uh, when you hear from GZA tonight, keep in mind that they're the city's hired engineering firm and they stand to gain from the dam's removal. In order to remove the dam, they must present an approved mitigation plan. They have no vested interest in the historic significance of the dam or Northampton's best interest. They're here tonight to present a plan for how the dam can be preserved only in the collective memory of the city of Northampton. And they seek your approval for a plan to mitigate the very history that they are about to erase. GZA is based in Norwood, Mass. They employ over 440 engineers, technical support staff, and 25 offices around the world. This is just business for them. 
We ask that you be bold and put your responsibility as a historic commissioner ahead of all else because the city you live in is about to destroy one of the most historic, most thoroughly researched pieces of its history. Do not agree to GCA's plan or any plan that's attached to the demolition of this 132-year-old granite artifact. You are the historic commission and the last line of defense to protect and preserve the Upper Roberts Meadow Dam. We, the Friends, have done our best for the last six years, but it will now take you to prevent this tragedy. Please reject the mitigation plan and now read your last handout that I gave you. With the Friends' efforts as their inspiration, Greenfield's Historic Commission has managed to save their dam in the 11th hour. This commission can do the same. It's not too late to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm Dee Boyle-Clapp. I'm also a member of the Friends. I'm also here to ask that you reject any request from the city to remove this asset and to share a few key points. Um, the underwater archaeologist that you may hear about later admitted that he was never on site himself. He signed off because he was never told about a possible millstone at the site. Years ago, we suggested the Friends that this site include a historic park and a dam overlook, noting the importance and the location of things such as Moody's Tavern, Allen Tavern, Edward, Edwards Tannery, Folding Mill Beam House, Roberts Meadow School. There's much more that existed in Roberts Meadow that has been removed over time. The dam is a crucial piece of that last remaining piece that it is, and it, we also want to highlight the engineering feat that it was. This did fall of just a number of years after the historic dam in Williamsburg Grove. It was the people that at that time were terrified. They did not want to see this ever happen again. This thing has been beautifully engineered. It stood the test of time. We ask that you preserve it. Tonight, GZA may also recommend that they put some kind of marker and move the dam's blocks to Pulaski Park. We support a park, but we say no. Leave the blocks exactly where they are. We also want you to know that you may see an inundation plan. This is this flood scenario that's based on a worst case scenario of a 500 year storm in which the dam would suddenly collapse, knock down the next two dams, and then flood the rest of the city. On June 29th, 2010, at a public hearing discussing this project, GZA and Terry Culhane, the, the Board of Public Works president or chair, admitted that that scenario is wrong. They conceded it and it is not true. And yet we've seen it presented over and over and again. Please, if you see this, this inundation map, think Hollywood, not reality. A 500 year storm alone would inundate Leeds and this, their worst case scenario also suggested a silt free reservoir. Terry Cullane himself has said that the dam, the water in the dam is only about this high, about thigh high. It's absolutely un, un, impossible for this to happen. Also, the town's been repeating over and over again that the cost of dam removal is $1.3 million. This is true only by omission. Missing are $450,000 in contracts to GZA that have taken place since 2011. Missing is $500,000 of dredging costs and also an estimated $500,000 in trucking fees to remove the sediment. The, e the cost would now exceed $2.7 million, which is double the $1.3 that's been claimed. The EPA right now is uncertain if the sediment should be removed. But if the dam and the reservoir go, the residents and the friends would fight like crazy. We insist that that dam, the sediment be removed. The neighborhood cannot be left with a destroyed dam, a, re a drained reservoir, and 10 years of stench as 80 plus years of decomposing material and dead fish would have to dry out. That is a rough estimate given to us by our engineers, 10 years. Dam removal is also rife with problems and most experience significant cost overruns, typically at 25%. If that is true in this case, the little dam removal would exceed $3.3 million, and we haven't even begun to talk about six acres of restoration of the waterway. The cost effective and the smart option is not removal, but seeking a hazard class re lowering, restoring the spillway, and strengthening the stream walls. A lot of this stuff is complicated. It's taken us four or five years to learn this and to, and to figure all this stuff out, and we've talked to many experts, and we are telling you the best that we know right now. I'm asking you to say no to removing this 1883 historic granite arch historic dam. There are other more cost effective ways, there are other less invasive ways, and we ask for your support in saying no to the GZA, no to the city, and keeping our neighborhood intact. Thank you. Thank you. Fair One enough. more time, sure. Councilman LaBarge. Um, when I received a call and I heard about apparently the granite blocks being used for Pulaski Park, I was amazed to hear that. I attended every hearing at the Senior Center on the vision of what we had roundtables 
we had three or four, how many meetings was it, Jim Rilla? Three. At the Senior Center. I never heard anything about mm -hmm. using the granite blocks for a retaining wall. What I'm suggesting is if they do remove the dam, that all my neighbors, okay, as their city councilor and even in Ward 7, okay, that the committee who has worked tirelessly with the Board of Public Works, with the former mayor, that they have the priority to say how those granite blocks should be used. Either number one, to use it on the basing of, around the edging of, of the water, if not, to do a memorial. So I feel that they should be brought in on any kind of movement that's happening on this dam. And I'm, I'm very surprised to hear because it was never mentioned at our open public hearings of using the granite block. So I don't know where this has all come from. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll take one more comment. Uh, we uh, my name's uh, Wayne Tebow. Me and my wife, Francis, live across from the reservoir. We've been there for approximately 45 years. And we were members of the Friends of the Dam. And uh, a lot, of, a lot of things that you heard tonight, and a lot of, like the meeting and all that, that was all discussed, uh, we were never informed. I mean, we lived right across the road, right next to the dam. And we thought we were on a list that going through all these meetings that we, being in the butter, we'd at least be notified of, of the meetings, their presentation, or nothing was ever asked of us for our input. And, uh, I believe that people in the area, people of Leeds, should have input in there. And it was and it was tough when I heard about taking the blocks and bringing them down to Northampton <coughs> without talking to anybody else that lives in that area. Thank you. <coughs> okay, um, we'll move on in the agenda. Oh, <laughs> a couple more comments. Do we have a link to the other comments? We do. Okay. It is an agenda. Yeah, it, is. it could be. It is an agenda, Michael. So we'll take one more comment, and then why don't we hold it till we have right. the presentation Good evening. on the My name is Bruce Fuller, and I live in Perkins Avenue. And I brought in some. Uh, uh, Mike Kirby couldn't be here tonight. He's in California, okay. and I printed out a blog that he uh, and there's five copies here for each mm -hmm. member. Is that? Is that uh, this? Is that yeah. this? Ah, uh, no. yes. I mean, mine's in color. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but I think so you share. Have, I mean, I, I, I share it. Share it, please. When I came in the meeting, so I have to spend an hour. I think we did that. Copy. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Mike, I think uh, please read that and uh, uh, through its entirety, I think it's valuable information. Uh, I will speak for myself. Um, several years ago when I heard about the possibility of tearing down the dam, uh, I went up and take a look, uh, to take a look for myself what everyone was talking about. I have an engineering background as well as geology background. I have three degrees. <clears throat> I looked at that dam and I said, how in the world did they ever build that without modern equipment? It is rock solid. I'm amazed at, at the construction. And it's lasted all these years. Then I started thinking about other things. <clears throat> Maybe the historical <coughs> commission remembers Shepherd's Hollow fire. I'm sure some of the residents in the neighborhood <coughs> do. That was a difficult fire to put out because the last hydrant with the city water supply is at the corner of Dimmick and Chesterview Road. Mm -hmm. If a fire occurs in the woodlands or in any of the residents upon, around the dam within a half a mile, the fire department is going to be in tough shape trying to put the fire out. It's a two-lane road, so you can't rely on the firefighting equipment from Westover Air Force Base. It won't make it up the road. All right? So I think that should be a concern. Um, 
The other thing I realized is that I remembered my days in college. I had a professor, Dr. Schmidt, and he was a great thinker, very well educated, and he used to say, you can learn more from a mud puddle than you can from a textbook. And I see the, the dam as a his, not only historical and as a, uh, a possibility for a reservoir for firefighting, should it ever occur, but as an educational field trip for students, it doesn't matter what grade, K through 12. They can learn biology, they can learn physics, they can learn chemistry, they can learn math. Why throw that away? I think that's, unless you have any questions, or anyone in, in the audience, I rest my peace. Okay, we appreciate the commentary, thank you. So we would be next move on to approving minutes. Uh, that is Taylor. Okay. All right. So next up on the agenda is the Albert Roberts Dam uh, discussion. So the engineers are present. And we have a copy of the agenda that I get to go. I just have a quick question. Um, I assume that this particular meeting that we have um, received appropriate notification through newspaper or whatever you do to announce a meeting of this particular committee? Yes, this okay. was posted in accordance so with So in other words, this agenda that we're looking at right now has been properly yes. um, broadcast, advertised, and everything like that. Okay. Just wanted to make sure on that. Um, and having um, you know asked that question, then I think we could then you know, identify you know, what it is we need to address specifically based on this agenda that is a public document. Uh, so that would be the correspondence from GZA. Okay. Um, regarding the so so it's titled Proposed Upper Roberts Meadow Reservoir Dam Removal Request for Meeting with the Campus Historic Commission. Okay. And it's dated January, but it snowed every Monday. So. Right. <laughs> can you take a moment so that I can review this? Because again, these meetings were sure. scheduled for so long ago. So just a clarification on the agenda item, it is a discussion. There's no decision. I to need to verify that with GZA, okay. but I, I don't believe we need a vote. And there were no representatives from GZA? Okay. No, GZA and the DPW right here. Oh, okay. okay. Right. Um, so this is basically an information gathering for us. And at some point we may have to make a, we may have to vote on approving or not approving, but we're not doing that tonight. Uh, it's not on the agenda. Well, votes, sure. aren't always, votes aren't always specifically listed, but we may, we may want to talk to GZA about exactly what they're requesting from us at this point. Sarah, we're just looking for a discussion tonight. Okay. It doesn't need to be a vote. There was a preliminary discussion about mitigation. Mm -hmm. So there'll be, there'll be other opportunities to take a vote on, on things. Yeah, I mean, I think that would be uh, much better just because this is new to us as a committee, our right. commission, and our chairs, a couple of our members are not here, and it's apparently, you know, a very serious um, issue for a number of members of our community. So we would want to certainly take the time and be educated, all of us, before we were asked to take a vote. So this is good. Um, so would everyone like to take a minute just to review this? Or would, do we want to move into the presentation? OK, so let's move on. Um, so we have representatives from GZA, or Jim, or Murr would like to see. Nice to come. Of course. Oh, yeah. So I'm Jim Larla from the Public Works Department. I have with me Paul Davis from GCA. And um, I guess we'll, we have a brief presentation, but to thank you Great. for putting us on the agenda. Mm -hmm. We want to thank you for stopping the storm tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so we could come for a visit. Um, the uh, the Upper Roberts Meadow uh, Dam. The removal project is, is moving ahead within the Public Works Department. 
Um, it's a project that we've been working on for, um, for a number of years. Um, and as it, as it pertains to the Northampton Historic Commission, there are important historical elements of the dam, uh, as you're aware of, either from prior meetings or from comments that were made this evening. Um, the, the city is obligated as we go through the permit process to come up with um, historical mitigation for the removal of the dam. And that was the reason that we uh, requested to be put on the agenda was just to reintroduce sort of the project to you yeah. and to talk about some of the ideas that we have for historic mitigation. GZA submitted the one on our behalf. There were mitigation uh, elements that we came up with within the Public Works Department um, in conjunction with GCA and they wrote the letter for us. Um, but their, um, their elements um, to acknowledge and respect the history of the project that um, we're considering as part of the mitigation. Now the, uh, the reason that we wanted to meet uh, with you tonight was just to have an introduction to these elements. Um, the city is, is ready to um, start submitting uh, various permit applications with uh, the regulatory agencies that will start sort of a more formal process to deal with um, the historical mitigation. Um, and we wanted just to let you know so you wouldn't hear from the Army Corps of Engineers or someone else that the permit process has started. Um, and I guess I'll say that um, we do realize that there's a lot of, there's a lot of love and concern um, about the dam. We had um, many, many meetings um, over the course of a couple of years. I added, the, I added them up before I came to the meeting. Uh, over the course of about two years, there were about 50, there were over 50 public meetings in the city about the dam. Um, so that gives you a that gives you a pretty good sense of the passion that people feel um, for the project, and, and you're seeing that tonight, and, and we appreciate that, and we want to um, we want to make sure that the mitigation that we um, ultimately do, that the city ultimately does in the project, is respectful of the dam, that um, people have an opportunity to look at the mitigation that's being proposed. Um, some of the folks that are in this room. I will, I will say not copying them on the letter was an oversight on my part, and just for informational purposes, um, I could have made sure that, that this letter went to them. But um, having said that, we wouldn't get very far in the project without contacting the people in this room. And we had many, many meetings. I was at uh, many of the Board of Public Works meetings at the end where we said that we would continue to work with the friends through the course of the project on mitigation. We have some, uh, some mitigation ideas here that would ultimately be incorporated into a memorandum of understanding between the Corps of Engineers and the Mass Historic Commission. The Historic Commission has, a has, has, has asked that the Public Works Department copy the friends on information regarding the historical mitigation and things that happen associated with the dam. So I could have copied them on this letter. I probably, um, I could have done that but ultimately, w these discussions will happen anyway. So our focus at the time was to get some information in front of you folks so we could begin having a little bit of a discussion mm -hmm. so that you could see what our ideas are at Public Works and whether the Historic Commission has specific thoughts about mitigation for when the dam comes down. Um, I'm an engineer. Um, I have great appreciation for history. I'm not a historian. Um, we have ideas about the types of things we think might be nice. We're trying to work within reasonable budgets to honor the history of the dam. Um, we would really look forward to information from people that are more knowledgeable in this area than we are as we move ahead. That was one of the reasons to, to come before you tonight. So um, having, having said that, I guess um, I'll turn things over to Paul, um, who will just he can walk through the contents of the letter. It's not very complicated. Some of our ideas at this point. He has a very small map for the uh, visually challenged, like I am. It'll be a little hard to uh, to look at, but it it shows the it shows the um, the basic site condition. Um, for those of you that have had a chance to read the letter, um, one of the ideas is to leave a permanent walking trail up around the right abutment of the dam. We would, where we would have historical sign installed um, acknowledging the history of the dam and making that available so people could appreciate that in the future. That would be a long-term event. The, 
Can I ask a, I think it's a clarification question before you go on with this? This letter and what you would seem to be proposing to talk about are to give us information about the um, proposals for mitigating the dam, or the area where the dam, you're saying the dam will be um, demo uh, demolished, taken apart, whatever. So I just need to be refreshed. Was, is there a def definitive decision that yes, this dam is coming down? And if so, is it the city voted on this, or the city council voted on this, or did Mass Historic sign off on this? I just need to be brought up to speed, because again, this is the first time that we're really hearing about this coming up again, and it's been so long ago that we first addressed any of these issues. I'm just I'm a little confused as to where the process really is. Right. Again, you're really talking about mitigation to memorialize something, and I want to know what the other right. factors so are. That's basically the question. Yeah, I, I want to know what the other is factors that, um, are. Demolition or not is not on the table. It's going to be demolished. Right. Therefore, you're required to go through the mitigation process, and that's what the information is that you're giving us. Somewhere, someplace, in the sky or wherever, someone has decided that it's going to go down. Right. That's not on the table here tonight, nor is it our that's what decision. I to do. That's what I'm to uh, sure. Yeah. So, the decision I can provide a little bit and of also background. Just, I mean, just yeah. to add it to what Barbara yeah. and um, everyone was saying that. Um, I am, have been involved in the historical, the historic district commission, but I'm actually a new, fairly new member to the historical commission, so this is the first time I'm actually seeing this at all. I didn't really know much about it. I have to say, well, I biked up in this area a lot. I never knew the dam was here, so this, I'm going to appreciate the map. Sure. sure. So I, w I wanted to, uh, I'll provide a brief overview Great. of the history, and I wanted to be, um, I wanted to be sensitive to your time too and not, not go in places that you don't want to go. Mm -hmm. So if I start to go, you, yeah. you can rein me in. Um, generally, from, from March of 2008 to November of 2010, um, there were over 50 meetings within the city to discuss the dam um, and the decision to, to take the dam down. Um, the city was under an order from the state office of dam safety um, to do something with the dam, either uh, invest money to bring it up to current code or to remove it or to take some other mitigative action. Um, uh, the Public Works Department had worked with GZA to look at uh, different options to, uh, to either uh, bring the dam up to current standards or look at a, a breaching option. Ultimately, the Board of Public Works voted um, to breach the dam or to remove it. That was in uh, 2008. And then, um, because of a lot of concern, of which you heard uh, quite a bit tonight, um, there, were, there were public meetings, um, some of them were public posted meetings with presentations, information about the dam and what the department was doing. Many of the meetings were Board of Public Works meetings. Um, there were many city council meetings. There were um, conference committee meetings, which is a joint uh, City Council and Board of Public Works meeting to discuss the dam. Um, and then, uh, uh, the city went back um, at the request of the friends and postponed. There was, a, there was a delay in the decision to make the dam to go back and revisit it based on a lot of information that was submitted, um, which we took seriously and evaluated. Um, so there were, there were City Council meetings, there were there was references, this was back when Claire Higgins was the mayor, there were some meetings with, with Mayor Higgins at the time. Um, there were meetings with the, the CPC, as, as was mentioned earlier. Um, ultimately, um, the Board of Public Works, based on all of those meetings and all of the information that was submitted and, and evaluated and added to, ultimately in 2010, the Board of Public Works re reaffirmed their earlier decision to breach the dam. So there was sort of a long process that happened at that time. Um, and since that time, which was November 2010, we've been working on um, permitting the project with GCA. We had submitted an expanded, well, basically a, an environmental impact report to the state that described a lot of the history of the dam and what we were trying to do. Um, that, was, that was submitted in um, January 2013. March of 2013, we received a record of decision from the state indicating that, yes, we understand that the dam is going to, will, will be removed. These are the things we would like you to pay attention to during permitting. So in the last 
year or more, we have been working closely with the regulators about how best to remove the dam. And someone had mentioned, there were a couple of comments about sediment management and to being an important part of the project. Um, the state's thinking about how a dam gets removed. There have been a number of dam removals in the state um, the last, last two or three years. The, the approach uh, and money spent to remove a dam, it's becoming easier. It's a, the state is, is keenly interested in seeing dams that are uh, posing a hazard to be removed. So um, suffice to say, we've been working closely with the agencies, and we're at the point where we have a lot of permit applications today that are gonna go in. It's the permit application that goes into the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that um, starts the historical mitigation right. um, portion of it. Um, so that's sort of where we are. So there was a long, I feel like there was a long, pretty transparent public process <coughs> for over two years about it. Um, it's unfortunate that decision, not everyone agrees, um, but the de that decision was made and public works staff have been moving in the direction of, of the removal of the dam in terms of the permits that are necessary and the approach to get that done. We've identified grant opportunities. We have received a couple of different grants to make it a little bit less expensive to remove the dam. Mm -hmm. um, and we have one very large grant that's hanging out there that may, for the, that may pay for the whole dam removal. So there are, those are different aspects of things that we've been working on in, in the interim. Um, so once we submit the Army Corps of Engineers permit, there will be a process that will start related to the historical mitigation. And, um, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'm going to talk about Pulaski Park for a minute because that's another project that, that I'm managing and then I'll have to talk about the things that are happening on the dam site. The idea to reuse the architectural blocks from the, from the dam if, when the dam is removed and brought up to Pulaski Park um, was an idea that I came up with at the end of the public meetings that Council of March had mentioned. Um, I can't recall if we specifically mentioned that in the meetings. We may not have. Um, I needed to make sure that there was going to be some synergy between the dam removal project and the renovation to Pulaski Park before we started discussing the use of architectural blocks or using them. Um, when the dam comes down and the park is renovated, I think it's a nice way to honor the history of the dam by having not only a historical sign at the dam site, but also to have an, a historical acknowledgement at Pulaski Park, which is in the center of the city. I think it, 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 it's a nice synergy. Again, I'm, I'm an engineer, maybe, maybe it's not a great thing. It seemed nice to me um, from a historical standpoint. It also seems nice to me from the standpoint of the fact that granite blocks are very expensive and if we're able to reuse those at Pulaski Park for benches or other things, it ends up saving the city money on that project. So there was, there was a, a nice tie-in. I still don't know if it, the schedules will work and I acknowledge that in the letter that if it works, great, and if it, if it doesn't, the timing may not allow us to do that. But we're trying to make it work if we can. So do you want to talk about the, sure. the mitigation on the dam site? Okay. And, uh, yeah. <coughs> Thanks, Jim, for that, that introduction. You saved a lot of things that I might have otherwise said, so I had to say. Um, so uh, again- Let me just interrupt you for sure. a second. Um, and I don't mean to sound really boring. Um, so the, the dam is- uh, been determined to be um, unstable or unsafe. And um, my understanding from the friends is that they they really cherish probably the, the pond that it's supporting, the water body that it's supporting. So when it comes down, that would revert to a, a stream. Or, right. So it, it, there would no, no longer be a pool there, but the dam is pulling up. Right. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I didn't say my name for the record is Paul Davis with GZA. Uh, and I'm an environmental scientist, a, a wetland scientist, and a uh, luminologist. So that's my background studying freshwater systems. And I'll be involved in getting the permits as we move forward or trying to get the permits. Um, and um, this part of this process, as Jim said, and, and you mentioned 106, so you, you, is, is the board commission fully versed on what the section 106 process is worth talking about, or if you don't need to? Don't need to. I, I don't know what it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. But, but basically, suffice it to say, as Jim mentioned, as we go to the Army Corps of Engineers to, set, to seek the section 404 permit under the Clean Water Act, um, one of the, for any uh, structure or, or uh, uh, that is eligible for listing in the National Register, 
um, it, it does invoke the uh, section 106 um, and that process involves it's basically it, it is a process it's not a permit per se but it's a process which involves coordination with lots of different entities which have historic concerns obviously this board is, is one of those important ones so here we are um, and again this is the beginning of a conversation it was not intended to, to be a decision making venue it was just to get your input to us based on whatever ideas we had initially as to what mitigation uh, for the dam coming down would might look like from a historic perspective um, so recognizing that we still have a ways to go in terms of figuring out what the final mitigation might look like um, so with that said um, uh, for my introduction anyways um, the, the elements that uh, that aren't the Pulaski Park related reuse of the blocks um, we thought that um, that some preservation of the structure of the dam seemed to be important um, so that's item one on the, on the letter if you're looking at it um, so as the uh, the dam is starting to be uh, taken apart um, stone by stone um, we're going to try and leave as much of the abutment structure as we can to the extent that it doesn't impede the flow of the stream which obviously we have to get down to the bottom of the dam it, it, to some extent it's going to we're going to know that as it comes apart the, the dam engineers basically say they really can't predict precisely right now what that would look like so they're going to have to try to figure it out but the, there will be a standard a goal to the contractor in consultation with DPW and the engineer to preserve as much of that as, as is feasible uh, such that you don't create an unsafe condition obviously but the idea would be ideally we would be leaving visible abutments for either side of the dam so you can see part of the original structure there's also a dike wall there which presumably doesn't have to be touched at all and that would be visible as well um, so there would be sig some significant remnants portions of the structure itself uh, that would be retained um, and, and the, only re the only reason I have to be a little bit um, uh, fuzzy on that as to what exactly it would look like is because we won't know until we start to take it apart exactly how much can be retained um, we also want to uh, use some kind of historical monumentation up there. Um, we started talking about it. originally we were thinking coming in from the Chesterfield Road side, but that's really a pretty steep drop off there, or what will be a steep, oh, well, it is a steep drop off on the downside of the dam, but it would be also in all parts of it at that point, what's left over from the abutment. And it seemed to make sense, and some of this, that needs to be an access on the north side of the stream coming up from Kennedy Road. That, that could be left as a public access way. Um, and we could create some historic monumentation on that side near the dam abutment that's left over in the dike wall um, that could be used with some historical signage. And we'd be looking uh, for input uh, from this board and others as well um, to see what that might say, or what type of information might be on that sign. There might be some visual you know, pictures, you, know, you can mount those right into it. Uh, so there's some different possibilities of how to move forward with that. Some of the, the um, signage, if you will, or, or memorial, if you will, the, um, the, the monumentation might include some of the materials that come from the dam itself. Um, and there is, um, it's actually the last one I mentioned there, number five, but I'll talk about it now since we're talking about that, is the BUAR, Bureau of Underwater Archaeological Resources, indicated that um, there was possibility, and it was mentioned before by one of the commenters, uh, the public mentioned the possibility of an old millstone being present at the base of the dam. I haven't personally seen it myself, but it, it's, it's a little bit deep right at the base of the dam. Um, but uh, during the, uh, the, the, the demolition, that will be uh, looked for, and if it can be retrieved, it will be retrieved. And that's a possibility for using as part of that, uh, uh, that monumentation. Uh, so, so those are the ideas there, and obviously there'd be a public path be, would be made look from the access road we would take out the access road because we don't want a permanent road there there's a there's a woods road there now if you've been up that way um, the, which was used for logging it's a it's a chained access it's not allowed nobody can really drive in there now you can walk in it, although I don't think that's technically allowed um, but there is a chain across it but um, it would be possible and uh, DPW has been interested in the idea of having that be transformed into a walking trail basically at the end of the, of the, uh, the demolition and that would go up directly to access the, uh, the monument um, 
that would be left over and built in place, as well as the, uh, the nearby abutments that could be viewed. Um, so, so those are some ideas for how we would do that. The details of that would be worked out in future conversations, um, and uh, uh, we, would, we would look to do that. And then the, the, other, the last one that was mentioned, as Jim mentioned, was the possible reuse of the blocks, perhaps for Pulaski Park, uh, as he mentioned. So those are, you know, just five concepts, if you will, that of what we thought might be um, some ability for us to provide uh, uh, historical monumentation, historical uh, recognition of the significance of the dam, and uh, have it be a lasting memory um, for, for the structure that it was and the importance that it was in the community. Um, so um, that being said, just to, to let you know that kind of the next steps with this would be um, would be filing the Section 404 application that will initiate, as said before, the Section 106 process. As that process evolves, and it'll take a little bit of time to evolve, um, what would come out of that would ultimately would be a memorandum of agreement. And that memorandum of agreement, uh, it's led, it's an activity that's led by the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, they're the lead federal agency. So they would be the one responsible for developing it. The way it typically works in their world is usually the applicant provides a first draft, which we will do. Um, but that first draft would reflect uh, conversations and input from, from various parties as to what that mitigation might look like. So as that process evolves, there'll be more conversation. I just had a quick question on your site plan. Where, where would the parking area be for public access? Um, that's a, a good question, and quite frankly, we didn't uh, we didn't identify public parking per se in that area. But there is a, there are areas right at the. If you notice, there's a couple of areas that are noted for construction staging on there yeah. at the intersection, and um, they're right at the intersection of Kennedy Road and uh, Sylvester's Road. Um, and uh, I, I presume that those would be amenable for public parking. People would have to obviously cross to get over to that access way. But, yeah. So it's just not on the street parking. It, you would no, no, no. I don't think that would be that practical in that location. A primary consideration. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, mean, I think I would just. Um, it sounds like you know you've got some really interesting ideas about. Um, uh, preserving history and possibly making this a little bit more accessible to the public. And it would seem to me, you know, this project is very similar to, um, in some ways, uh, Craig, to the Shelf Bridge project up in Northfield, um, where there's a historic bridge structure on the Connecticut River that is deteriorated and it's on the National Register. It's very historic to the you know, especially that community mm -hmm. and it has to come down. But this, there's a whole effort to, you know, make this really great, um, set up public parks on either side of it and possibly reconstruct it in a different way. Um, so I think it really, this seems to have some similarities in the sense that it seems like there's an opportunity here to make it a place that the public, more of the public can really enjoy. It would, it would definitely be more <coughs> accessible because walking in the watershed is not allowed by the, by the Department of Public yeah, Works right now. That, yeah. yeah, so that would be a you know, an important policy change to make it available for, so people can enjoy that and take a look. Any comments? So when will we hear back from you? And when will we be in a position to make some kind of formal? Well, I, I think certainly if you want us back before you, um, before basically the 106 process formally begins, I, I don't mm -hmm. think there's anything that prevents that from happening. But um, if we wait for the triggers to take place where that would happen, probably, uh, well, we're, we're very close to submitting. I, I hate to put a date on it because somehow dates keep slipping, but, um, but we're, we're very close to submitting the 404 and 401 applications, which would go hand in glove. Um, and at the moment that those happen, um, then it'll be up to um, the, uh, the regulator at the Corps of Engineers to determine how fast the project proceeds. It is a um, we're filing under a general permit, as we're allowed to do, for this type of project. Um, so the timelines are more or less at their discretion. Um, but a typical process for a, um, a 404 application is the honor, on the order of about three months. Uh, but it can take longer, but we're hoping it won't. 
Um, so, so I would say, you know, we're going to want, they, they can't issue their permit until the 106 process is complete. Or if they did issue a permit, it, it wouldn't mean anything because it, it can't be enforced until the, the, the process is complete. Uh, and they won't. Um, so, you know, we will be motivated to try to move this process along as soon as possible. So I would assume you would be hearing back from us certainly within four weeks' time. So I would, I would, I mean, I can say the commission members about this, but I mean, I think it would be important for us to review um, the, you know, final or you know, whatever your mitigation plan ends up being, that the historical components of that, so that we feel sure. comfortable that uh, the historical integrity of this site is being well um, respected and honored mm -hmm. and commemorated, and that you know, it, and, and there's going to be enough or appropriate public access to it. Uh, am, am I that? Right, I, I think that's absolutely correct. And I think that one thing that might um, make this more palatable on the preservation of the blocks, uh, instead of definitively saying they shall go to Pulaski Park, uh, list that as one option. There might be other options perhaps in the neighborhood. Uh, there might be ideas or that could come up or at the site. So in other words, to build some flexibility yeah. into this. Um, and I think that uh, is something that uh, you know, would be an, uh, an appropriate thing for the community to, to have a final say. Yeah, and, and I think also, again, there's something about public access. You know, I know there's limit, there are limits on yeah. um, how the land can be used around this, but uh, any, you know, any way it can be made into more of a community park-like environment um, that encourages use by all of the people of Northampton and mm -hmm. surrounding towns, um, mm -hmm. you know, for recreation and then also to learn about history would be great. So. Very good. And if you have other ideas, in the meantime, you know, let us know through Sarah or um, whatever. We have we have some signage from, from other dam removal projects, which are sort of interesting, but we would really seek input on, on the types of information that would go on the site. So I think before we're done, we'll have a lot more detailed discussion about that. Okay. So. You know, one thing I, I will say that the, the memorandum of agreement is not like a blueprint plan where it dictates precisely what things will look like, but it, but it does say, and it puts teeth into it, um, that it shall happen and it shall be done in coordination with and everybody shall agree at the end of the day. Um, so. You will have input in that. Um, I don't think it's mandatory that this commission would be a signatory, but it's common. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So we would expect it, unless you think otherwise. It would be advised for the section. Well, yeah, I mean, if you, if you were signatory to it, you would obviously be a player right. in making sure that the mitigation, and, and quite frankly, the structure was recognizing mm -hmm. as being eligible for the National Register based on its local yeah. significance. Sure, yeah. So and the Mass Historic has to sign off on it. Mm -hmm. Yes, they would be a signatory. They're well, really, only the instigating agency would be the Corps of Engineers. That's correct. Okay. So they have the final say so. And it's my understanding of the Section 106 process, even if there are objections from Mass Historic, Corps of Engineers can override those in the long run. I think that's true, but I also think it's rare. It's rare, but it's true. Sure they so we like just need to pick. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're going to be, they're concerned about safety. Oh, I know. Safety. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And thank, thank you, you also for coming. It was um, very helpful to hear your, <coughs> your passionate thoughts. So. Okay. <laughs> so next is New Hampshire County Jail.
Fondly known as the Union Street Jail. This is Richard Groening, who's um, the brother of one of our owners, also. Um, and we are here in support of our application to the Community Preservation Act um, for funding for the Union Street Jail rehabilitation and restoration of its granite staircase. The reason we are here, which Sarah just clarified, was that um, Richard has uh, written and submitted an application on our behalf to the Mass Historical Commission, but that status has not yet been granted. Um, so we're seeking your blessing for our CPA application that is currently um, under review. Um, uh, just a quick um, framing of where we got to this point. In 1984, the Hampshire County Planning Department uh, issued an RFP for reuse and development of the Hampshire County Jail and House of Corrections site. Okay, within that were county, city, and neighborhood objectives that were spelled out that had to do primarily with the preserving the historic structures that are there, reusing the building in a way that is historically sensitive and also sensitive to the surrounding community. Um, it went on to talk about um, conditions that they wanted met in the um, successful applications, and, which we did, and it's here. And there were, um, disappeared. Oh, here, there are nine of these conditions, which um, basically talk about the use of the site and um, little or no demolition or alteration to the exterior, retaining the character of the windows, reuse plan incorporating ramps or other method methods to provide for access, et cetera. Um, uh, a couple of months ago, we learned um, that the uh, structure beneath our, our iconic granite staircases, both north and south sides, so front and back, are, are decaying and crumbling and at, at risk of, of collapsing. And they're closed. The, the footing, the foundation underneath? Yes. The, the stringers, the interior supports. Uh -huh. Yeah, the, those, and then the stairs go across like that. Right. So these are. Um, so those staircases are now closed and um, our owners have um, gone ahead and um, invested in preliminary um, emergency measures to make sure that those are stabilized while we investigate other options, which not only include um, the restoration, but also um, putting in place a longer term master plan for the building because we're all pretty committed to the place. We love it and call it home. Um, so. Um, that said, I want to introduce Richard Groening, um, who has uh, done fabulous uh, historical research and writing for us. He is a historian, and um, and it will give you the, the, in a nutshell, version of why this is such an important building to the community. I think you've all received these LinkedIn, you know, well it's a done. good thing to read before you go to bed and before you yeah. sleep. No, it was, it was written it was really well done. No, it's and really I, good I know how hard it is to feel about the inversion of the, but it was really good to read it all. And then, and then it about. also has the uh, supporting documents such as this uh, mm -hmm. yep. planning department document right. and other yeah. planning mm -hmm. department really documents. Um, but essentially, as you know, this very short, crazy uh, set of points will indicate, it's. It was proposed in 1850, uh, designed in 1851, occupied first, I think, in 1853. It was designed by a premier Boston architect, Ridley J.F. Bryant, uh, and a noted prison reformer, 
uh, Lewis Dwight of the Prison Discipline and Society, who was a proponent of the put them away at night, but integrate them with other inmates during the day as opposed to solitary penitentiary um, uh, uh, confinement. And it was a model. It was a, a new kind of model, uh, 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 an alternative to penitentiary design. Um, this was something that he also did in Dedham at the Norfolk County Dale. He did it in Charles Street Jail, which yeah. is now the Liberty Hotel. Yeah, so, I, I, yeah, I mean, so he's he's quite noted for this. And the Massachusetts Historical Society deemed this in 1984 uh, a very rare surviving example of mid-19th century prison uh, design. Um, in 1984, they called it eligible for a national registry. But they told us that because of the lapse of years since that last inventory, that we need to reapply, and that's what we've done. And that's that's the genesis of these two essays. Mm -hmm. uh, they're part of the application uh, for that, plus you know, dozens of photographs and maps and all sorts of uh, uh, information that coincidentally doesn't seem to be present in their <laughs> inventories for a lot of other buildings that are already on the register. Oh, yeah, you know, so it's like they were put on yeah. you know, in the yeah. 70s. No, these are yeah. buildings that were put on in the 90s and oh, the really? okay. 2000s. So, um, but I think it has a very distinguished place in the community. Uh, it's his, architecturally, I think it's distinguished. Yeah. Uh, and certainly, the, I, I sort of recapitulated the accounts of the building uh, in the Daily Gazette over the years. Oh. Not only uh, when it was uh, planned and they de described the, uh, uh, the layout and the use of the, of the, of the different um, components, but then how it, how it functioned in the building, especially, or within the community, especially at the time of its proposed conversion. You know, where the city, I think the county gave it to the city because the county couldn't afford to do anything with it, and then the city couldn't afford to do anything with it, and then they put it up for what they hoped was community use, but the only proposals they received were from uh, condominium developments, which you know, we would be, uh, decided to be the best uh, uh, that lot. But it had a very strong position in the community. You know, it was never said, no one ever said tear down you know, get rid of it. So I think it's iconic. I think it's uh, historically significant. And we would like to maintain it as it, you know, in its outward physical appearance. I think it's, it's instructive that, as opposed to these other uh, jails uh, that have since been converted, it retains its outbuildings. The garages are still garages. The work release building, where they chained uh, chair, make chair bottoms and did other sorts of projects, so, are now townhouses. Um, and you know, it's it's there hasn't been a lot of change outwardly in, in the buildings, and we are at a crisis. We have undertaken we have. We have taken on Boston Bay Architects, who did Forbes Library, or currently working on the uh, old courthouse at, at Maine and uh, Pleasant, uh, supervising those renovations. And we've taken them on as consultants. Uh, they've done the initial inspection. They've given us um, uh, their recommendations. We've undertaken and paid for the first part of the project, which is a temporary shoring so that the stairs are no longer a danger uh, uh, to, the, to the people in the building. Uh, but for the next two, for the permanent restoration of the stairs, and then for what we think is the most crucial element, a long-term master plan that will look at all sorts of things that need to be done to maintain the integrity of the building, you know, we, we are desperate for outside funding sources. And so, therefore, we need to be called significant so that we can we can fulfill the requirements for a uh, community preservation board. 
So, Sarah, would this be part of the, maybe, you know, the part of the primary terrorist national register district? And I, don't I don't think so. No. Really? It's a team, yeah. I, don't I know it's, it's on the other side, but the cemetery is part of it. It's sort of, the cemetery is sort of just a jog mm -hmm. at the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's exactly it's but, yeah. but it did not include Union Street. Yeah, yeah that's too bad. It's it's a, it's a, it would have, but it's a different era, and it has to be a, a cohesive yeah. story. Oh, I see so what you're saying. Yeah, that's then. true. It's a light, right? Right. It is a different so mm -hmm. Okay. I was just wondering about that because that, that would also help you too. But. Mm -hmm. uh, so I. Just looking at the significance, to me, this is a what's not the like project. Oh, it's so yeah, You guys yeah. are going to fix it up. It's like a historic building in town. Yeah. What can we do to help? Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that's really important to know, though, is that, um, you know, we're not community housing no. formally. However, we, we are on the more affordable side of life um, on by Northampton terms. Our residents have already invested $200,000 in a new roof. Um, we've already invested in the, the emergency temporary shore, which we won't know until that's done whether that will actually allow us to use those staircases, and if so, for how long. So, so we're still in that interim phase. Um, our application is for the rehabilitation and restoration of the two staircases. We can approach that in phases if need be. You know, we can deem that the south side, front side is more important than the back or vice versa, depending on availability of funding and um, the outcome of this temporary shore. Um, and, and, you know, that's really a, a big chunk of the project. And then down the road is phase three with the master plan, and that's something we also intend to take on. Um, but at this point, we're really looking at that, that critical, um, we need to fix our staircases mm -hmm. in a way that's going to last another 160 years, because that's how long it's been. <laughs> so it's been good so far. And another point is that even though we, we're not quite aware of what they might entail, we are open to a permanent historic preservation easement or restriction if, if that's deemed necessary for uh, you know, not not for Pacific your determination, but for future yeah, public. Yeah. 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 And actually, with, if it's on listed on the National Register, uh, Mass Historic will give you a lot of design guidance. Mm -hmm. uh, the one question I have: uh, you might be required to um, provide accessible stairways and entrances, and therefore the design is going to be a little bit different. Um, but your architect knows yes. how to do that yes. and, and in a, an appropriate manner. We're also uh, very close to that as we exist currently. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, do we need to vote on supporting? Um, uh, all, yeah, all we need I is the we have a motion that we recognize it as historically significant. Yeah, and it could also be to support the application. Right, right. You could potentially find it significant and not support the application. Okay. You could look that into one vote. Does the CPA Northampton now allow CPA monies to go to private properties? They always have. That's not a prohibition in state law, but they've always preferred that there's some money. Two hundred fifty thousand the first churches, the first. Yeah, and the Northampton Historical Society. Yeah, private. Right, but again, I mean, I think we. I, mean, I would move that, but so I would move that we vote to find the Union Street Chair, or actually call it that, <laughs> what is it, Coolidge, uh, Coolidge Park Condominium Association, but the, the building at um, 50 Union Street, which used to be the, uh, uh, the county jail, and that's correction, um, that's historically significant, and that we will also support the um, application to the, to the CPC. And, and I think that's the end of the motion. But I think that also the, um, because again, if it's a private thing, it's still there, this group is, there's, there's public benefit in that this is an historic building with its outbuildings, and so at least the exterior is as it appeared, except for that walkway that was taken mm -hmm. that was between the two um, buildings. But I mean, that was like an outdated walkway, um, which obviously was approved at the time it was done in 84 or 85, whenever, whenever that was done. Oh. Yeah, there was a, there was, a, there was a, that was even in these documents. But anyway, um, but I, I still think there's there's public benefit in keeping those and trying to keep them looking as much as they do now. Well, I would second your motion. Okay. All in favor? I have one other 
thing. I would hope that there is some sort of good historical marker that would describe yeah. to me as a citizen what that is, what the history is. And I think perhaps working with historic Northampton, the ones that they have put up here in town are really outstanding. Yeah, that's great. And There's one right over by the with, cemetery. Out of that level, that would contribute to the yeah. public yeah. significance mm -hmm. and interest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just an old building. Yeah, right. Right. I don't know if it's identified. Is it identified in any way? No, uh, no. no. Yeah. And it's funny because we had a little uh, discussion about how to identify it in the application. And I said, Union Street Jail, because everybody knows yeah. what that right. is. Yeah. But I think calling a sign would be yeah. uh, really one of the proposals was at the time when this was restored that it was to make it secure storage and the people could just rent a, you know like those you could rent it and the way you'd have your key you <laughs> think you should have the key to the cell and it was going to just be called you know big house storage <laughs> oh my gosh it's great that you're doing this yeah. Good. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, we, we love where we live yeah. It really is a great, great spot. And, you know, well, this is what historic preservation is yeah. all about. Well, and you look at what's happened in Union Street since that, since it became condominiumized, and you know, since the mid '90s, it's just you know, it's it's fixed up one house. There was one done. really bad thing that happened. Yeah, there was a bad thing. But there's and it's nice being made into a, a, a lemonade <laughs> from a lemon. The house that Hovey restored was down. Yeah. After it won the historic preservation yes, that's true. And then the house was burned. He is He's not, not happy about that. No. Hobie's not happy. No, Hobie's not we're happy. We are not happy. Oh. And we're making the lemonade out of that lemon. It's in the statewide report on how to fill the holes on a demo delay ordinance this year. So. Thank you. All right. Thank you very thank much. You. Okay, um, so now we have the request for support for the Federal Emergency Fund. This is moot because they've already submitted okay. their application and letters have to be turned in with the application. So okay. this is not an issue. Right? It's a knockout of yeah. restoration of the interior. Okay. Now, how do you do this? Oh. Oh. I mean, we're talking that it's, it's the quality of the colonial um, and the Pittsburgh or the A Wing. Oh, I love that. Yeah, no, we, but it, it's pure. Yeah, okay. Tom Douglas did a good job. So the Fountain Project, do we want to update? Do, we, do, do you want to? We're meeting at 7, you can stay with me. Let me update. Oh, wait, you don't have to stay out there, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's moving along. I'll just be, speak really quick, quickly. Um, we engaged the uh, restoration company to look at the remnants and come up with a design which they've done. Um, and so tonight we're meeting just to figure out how we're going to move ahead with that. And um, we are also in the process of submitting to the planning board the park design, which got a little complicated um, with all the other stuff that's going on up there around the park. But I think we may have resolved it. We'll see. So does that anybody have any questions about that? Okay. Walking to our brochure? Yeah. Uh, the grant application, did we decide we needed to vote on that? What to grant the AstraZeneca Oh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know. Do we, we need to vote on that? Oh, is that finished? I don't know. I don't know the status of it. Yes. I don't need the status of it. Maybe Tom does. Yeah, Tom. Okay. Um, yeah. So the walking tour for sure we're not going to talk about. It's anything. just a standing idea. Yeah. I just put it on here. Mm -hmm. so we, this is our, this is our new bench. I know, I know. Okay. Someday I'll look at it. Any comments? Uh, yes, we have one. Uh, so Smith College is putting a new access ramp at Stoddard Hall. So these are the, these are the before photos. You can. You, you don't have to vote. And this is what this is what they're planning to do. This is the which is, which is a vast, vast. Yeah. Um, is this the building that's getting renovated? Yes. Okay. So this oh, I yeah, the windows. Yeah. This is the one. Yes. 
So I issued a certificate of non-applicability because uh, the work proposed is an access device and ramp not facing a street and not altering the historic character of a street. And it's um, much more exciting. Yeah, it's a big one. Are they really going to pay it? That's what's not just asphalt. I believe so. It looks like a concrete kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is more yeah. complimentary to the yeah. And then one that's coming up that I haven't done yet, um, Smith is going to be doing a lot of landscaping in front of, I'm not sure what the building is called, but right, it's the first building in, in the Elm Street district right across from the church. Is that College Hall? College Hall is right yeah. in the corner. Yes. Up, like up elevated. So they're, they're, um, they're burying the electric wires there and they're doing a lot of landscaping and it's, it's going to look great. And there is mail. above the walls when you drive by on Elm Street, you see all these lights sticking up. It's really bad. I can, and I, you know, I don't, I mean, I need to go back and look at our guidelines to see whether we, what we say about that kind so of thing. So we, we do not have authority if the lights meet zoning standards. Yeah, right. so the light, not all lights meet zoning standards. So yeah. a lot of them, like, like the red hill doesn't meet zoning from what we said, so we should be following up about that. But I'll oh, check. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, could you, because I just, it's really, Okay, mail. So mail, we have a copy of a letter, which I think you may have seen in the Coolidge Park packet uh, for Mass Historic to the director of the Coolidge Park Condo Association, just giving them some information about how to move forward with the National Register listing. Okay. Also see that. A uh, similar packet from Mass Historic to the Lead Civic Association regarding the Hotel Bridge. Uh, so they gave them some additional information about the National Register listing and then copied us. Is that the bridge yeah. that the art, the, on Arch Street there that you go under when you go past? No, it's, no. A, it's a truss bridge, like a mini version oh. of the shell bridge. Oh, it's not. It's right on Main Street and yeah. Water Street. Oh, yeah, yeah, The yeah. one that's closed yeah. to yeah. all access yeah. now. Right. Yeah. 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 No, they had right more, <laughs> more diminishing of the integrity of the bridge. So, yeah, CPA had paid for a, um, a structural assessment and the structural assessment came back, you should close the bridge and we need to do some additional work. Don't um, A copy of project notification form regarding the Northampton Lumberyard redevelopment. Mass Historic said with this very blurry stamp that it does not require any additional permitting. Um, and then this bold face like, um, oh wow, all the cameras Let's see. Okay. Uh, I really yeah. I recently purchased your publication, A History of Women in Northampton from 1600 to 1980. I'm a family genealogist searching for Mary Risley Hills, who, according to some undocumented information, lived in Northampton circa 1652. William Hills was her second husband, and following her death in 1655, William married Mary Warner Steele. My source relates that the Risley and Hills children were all raised in Northampton. Can you refer me to a local genealogy society or other help? Oh. So I guess I'll just refer you to the historic. Historic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
You might refer her to at least for forms. Yeah, I was going to say, are yeah. 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 <coughs> For some reason, there's a self-adjusted. Where's she from? Ah, uh, for And she will donate the history book to the local <coughs> genealogy library. Congratulations on its well done content. Yeah, there's actually, I think this year is the 35th anniversary of that mural, and it's for Brigham. Yeah, we're going to do a lecture series. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we're going to do a lecture series in, in oh, late wow. summer. Okay, that's it. Okay. Um, any other business? Yes. Bruce. Calling my book collection. Uh, I thought I would donate this one to the city. It's the first edition of the Recording Historic Structures put out by the National Park Service wow. Historic American Building Service. So and so it's that? got all the all the drawings and everything like that. There's a new edition out that includes all of the CAD requirements and electronic requirements. But if you still work with pencils or something, this works. But I thought I would donate it to the Preservation Library here at City Hall. It's worth about four hundred dollars, so I expect a letter of for tax purposes. Okay. Well, there's no other business we can do. And that's it. Thank you.